still kind of ply my trade. Uh, and yeah, I've still seen a fair few cap tables in my time. So like to think uh, I, I've you know seen quite a lot of this. And I've also got my colleague Michael with here with me today, who advises companies all the way from sort of pre-seed to seed. So any questions after the session about you know the kind of work we do, our product, how we can help, etc. That's what we're here for. Cool. Getting on to it. Cap table principles. So um, ultimately, I'm sure some people in this room already know what a cap table is, uh, and that's fine. And I, I realize this kind of introductory sent sex, you know, sentence here is, is quite basic, but effectively a cap table for you guys, it's a list of all the securities the company has issued and who owns them. But that's very easy to know, but what is important, you know, what is I suppose more important to know is, you know, who can that affect? And ultimately, it's not just you. Uh, it affects how your company will price future funding rounds. It ultimately affects your uh, ownership percentage in the business, um, which is not just important for you. It's also incredibly important for your investors, which we'll get on to later. Uh, it's also important from a control perspective because ultimately this will affect who needs to sign off on major company decisions and that ultimately affects how fast your business can move. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the introduction, this will also affect your due diligence conversation with investors. So I appreciate, again, this isn't, um, this it, cap table is not the market. It's not the USP, it's not the management team, it's not the unit economics, it's not the uh, sexy things that will perhaps is you know it's going to make your investors light our eyes light up. But what I will say about a cap table is that the way we think of a cap table here at Carter is it's pretty binary. A cap table either acts as an accelerant or as a handbrake. If it's an accelerant, all the players in the game, all the stakeholders are well aligned in terms of their motivations and their incentives. A handbrake is obviously where the wrong people have got the wrong amount of equity. And ultimately that just means the business can't move quickly or it just can't hire the right people. Or just very simply, people aren't incentivized to move this thing forward. And ultimately that's what a cap table is. Cap table, as we've said here, is a reflection of the players in the game and their incentives. Ultimately, startups are driven by people, and people are driven by incentives. On to the next slide. Um, any questions on that before I move on? I'm going to take that silence. But always feel. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That is not the subject here today. The subject here is is it's not a it's it's not a plug for Carter. <laughs> yeah, we'll be we'll be getting on to red flags, but before we do that, I just want to kind of drill into the principles of like why why this is important for you guys. And also I think that will tie into the, the six red flags effectively. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Uh, well, they could they are potentially using other providers, or they'll be using a spreadsheet effectively, um, which has. Uh, lawyer, I mean, lawyers don't necessarily manage the cap table, but they will be involved in it in some way. Yeah, so, we'll, we'll we'll get we'll get on to that later. Um, cool. Anyway, so just to kind of drill into more about why this cap table is important. Ultimately, you, you could talk about this forever with all this sort of thing, but ultimately, when you guys are thinking about your cap table, there are only two things you should be thinking about ultimately at the end of the day with all the kind of perambulations and things that can happen with your cap table. It all ties down to two things, which is economics and control. Um, that's, you know, that those are the guiding principles when it comes to these things. Um, and you know, when you're thinking of this, you want to say, like, how do these impact the most the people most interested in the cap table? So VCs, you know, they are obviously very concerned about economics control. You know, that when they look at the cap table, they want to know who is interested in this business, who who has the real incentive to drive this thing forward. Uh, not just the people, but also particularly the founders. If you guys are first time founders all the focus is on you. Obviously, the business has to be compelling and the idea, and they have to buy into that. 
but there's very little to judge on this stage. It's all about you, and obviously your, you know, your um, attraction as a, as an entrepreneur is important. But incentives will come down to that as well. In terms of another reason why VCs will care about this from economics control is because they also want to know who's running the business. Obviously, at this stage, it should be you, the founders. If, but if there are kind of people that have certain rights, which we'll, we'll touch upon later, you know, that, that's also a thing that's important to VC when it comes to an, an, analyzing you as a business opportunity. Uh, the other thing as well, which I think is really important, is your cap table, when you look at it, is effectively a static picture of, of, of where you are at that, you know, at that certain moment in time. But that's not how VCs will look at it. Or they, they won't look at it just like that. The cap table for them is almost a prediction of the future because they know when they, if they come to you or any, not just a venture capital investor, any other investor, they think, okay, well, this business may have to raise additional rounds of capital. If they have to raise additional rounds of capital. That means further dilution. And ultimately, if that predictor of the future doesn't look very good, if where you think in the near term, you're going to have founders who aren't particularly incentivized, that's a red flag. We'll get onto that later. But again, VCs don't just look at the now. They they look at the now and think of what will this look like in say a few years or you know ten years time. In terms of economics and control for you guys as founders, why this is important? Obviously, the cap table is your you know day to day tracker of economics and control. And then the other thing is actually compliance. This is rather boring, but it is crucial. There are certain filings that you need to make as when, when you have a cap table. And ultimately, you know, particularly when it comes to things like issuing share options to employees, if your compliance isn't kind of kept up to date, when you get to that life-changing moment in your business, whether that's a funding round or an exit perhaps, if you've done something wrong along the way, you could potentially trigger some major financial liability for your company. Or for, or, or for your employees. And ultimately, you don't, again, want that major life-changing moment in your business to be compromised by something which is a pretty clerical error. So going on to the next section, due diligence, unless there are any other questions before I move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're gonna we'll, we we'll, absolutely uh we're gonna talk about that later in presentations. So if you don't mind, we'll wait, we'll we'll cover that later. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, cool. Due diligence. So when it comes to you guys raising from investors, um, we're just going to say there is no standard format for a cap table, um, but there is a basic expectation of what should be on there. So on the left-hand side, this is a, this is a screenshot um, of what it looks like on cap desk here. Ultimately, when you're raising from investors, as I said, they want to know who are the stakeholders in this game. So not just the list of names on the paper, but who are these people? Are they founders? Are they investors? Are they advisors? Are they employees? If they if they own if they own some sort of economic interest in this business, it's crucially important to know who they are and also to some extent know what the control is. That goes on to my next point is I don't just want to know who, you know, who this person is. I want to know, you know, again, what extent of control uh, and uh, economic incentive do they have in this business? So what's, you know, if they have shares, what type of shares do they have? Um, when did they invest? Like, were they, were they someone who invested 10 years ago? How, how, how likely are they to be, you know, interested and incentivized in this business? Another important thing, which is important for dilution, is the company option pool size. A lot of people don't sometimes, you know, uh, put this on the cap table because they think, oh, well, these actually haven't turned into options yet. But no, it's incredibly important to be fully transparent and all that. Um, and that ultimately ties into this point of understanding what the full full number of outstanding shares shares is, what we call fully diluted share capital. So, you know, in the sort of the, the grand instance when everyone shares are exercised, what does everyone get? In terms of what's missing from the cap table, um, what we often see people omit when they come to presenting this sort of thing in fundraising is everything around control. So, for example, again, you could have a bunch of people on the cap table and you could say, OK, fine, they own 20 percent, they own 10 percent. But particularly with bigger investors, they might have certain rights, key rights in the governing the governance of that business. So, again, when you're raising from investors, if anyone has any sort of special rights, you want to be disclosing that. Secondly, tied to investors, you know, if certain investors are on the board, again, what are the board rights? To what extent are they 
uh, interfering with perhaps your management of the business. Hopefully not interfering too much, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an important thing to disclose. There are other things such as what we call general provisions like drag along and tag along. So you know, when can you kind of force other investors to exit? And likewise, when can other investors tag along in sort of some in some sort of liquidity event? And that covers control. On the economic side, this is a really important one, is you as founders, you have shares in the business, but what are the terms of your shares? If you were to leave, say, after a year, what happens to your shares? Uh, obviously, particularly you guys in the very, very early stages of your journey, you are going to be owning all of the equity. And if someone invests in you, but then you were to leave like a year later and you've gone away with all the equity, that's not a very appealing proposition for investors. So really understanding you know, how the company is protected with the provisions in your shares, that's really important for investors to understand. Um, likewise, if there are already investors in your business, new investors will want to know what the terms of those shares are to see how it impacts their economics of control. And this will be things like anti-dilution rights, cumulative dividends, liquidation preferences. I'm not going to go into those for now because everyone here is mostly, I think, like a first time found on this sort of stuff comes later. But if you have any questions about that, we could talk about that after this or just feel free to uh, drop me a message. Um, another thing which I think is much more important to you guys and what could happen if you're going to go out fundraising is if you go out raising through what I call promised equity. So if you raise by what's called a safe or a Levant subscription agreement, i.e. you are giving out equity, but no, no one knows exactly what percentage they've got yet because it won't be determined until there's a valuation set by a new round. Um, and a lot of people, again, when founders are raising, they don't put this in their cap table, but they absolutely must disclose it because ultimately it will convert to equity at some point. Um, so, yeah, so really make sure you disclose like what you've raised and all the kind of uh, key economic terms around that. And I've put some things here like is it a pre or post money safe valuation cap? discount, interest, et cetera. Sorry, I've got the nose thing flagging there. It's annoying. Sorry, you had a question. That's called a liquidation preference. Yeah, so basically a liquidation preference is, if, if, if an investor has a liquidation preference, it means in the event of, a, of an exit, um, they get their money first. There are loads of, I mean, it's 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 not just as simple as that, because there, there are loads of like ways you can flavor that mm -hmm. in terms of like how much money do they get back. Um, you could have invest, you could have multiple investors with multiple liquidation preferences, but ultimately, yeah, a preferential right over the money, that's called a liquidation preference in venture terms. <laughs> um, I would say it's it's it, it's more than that, but yeah, to confirm, we're 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 not lawyers. We're just no, no, that's that that's not our, our position is everything around the 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 administration of that, which I'll I'll go on to later about why why that's so important. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, this was, this is, um, yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. So, uh, basically, you know, as I said, there's no predetermined format for what a cap table should look like. Um, we're just drawing on experience here from things that are not commonly disclosed. And I mean, in fairness, you know, if I was to present to you a spreadsheet or or some, even if you were to use cars or something like that, it's not necessarily going to tell you all these things straight away. But the important thing about a cap table, and sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I actually have to think of a cap table in, in two lights, what's on it and what's off it. And it's really important to understand both of those things to bring the whole picture together, to understand effectively the economics and control levers of business. No problem. Cool. So I've got a little practical exercise here, which I'm sure everyone will love on, uh, on a Tuesday evening. Um, so put your knowledge to the test. Um, 
I've got a sample cap table here. I've got the founder of Pan European Solutions. They're seeking investment into their Series A round for their software startup. This is their cap table on the right-hand side. This is what they presented at least. What can you learn? We'll start with that question to start with. What can you learn from this? And if there are any Zoom comments, I'll happily take. Yes. Good start. Given, given a lot of equity to who? Yep, absolutely. We'll get onto that later, but yeah, I think typically you'll startups, understandably, when you're a first time founder, you have to wear many hats. And a common mistake we see is founders yeah, giving equity to employees rather than options, which has a lot more kind of benefits for, for the company. And in this instance, yeah, first engineer, first commercial hire, they've got quite a significant amount of equity. Um, so that is, well, A, a learning and, and a bit of a red flag, which we'll get onto later. Any other uh, things you think we can learn from this business? What, well, giving equity to employees? I will touch upon that later. I'm just going to come up. Yeah, th th so I think it really depends on what we mean definition of equity. So th there's there's shares and then there's options. So sh with shares, I have shares. That's it. I can leave the business tomorrow and I'm done. Options, there are certain rights that attach to those that incentivize you to stay for the long term. It's the main mean, yeah, sorry. So someone's asking what are preferred ventures? That's a good question. Um, if you don't mind, we'll go on to that question. Um, that's I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's a bit of a subtlety in the name for ventures. I, if I was an investor looking at this cap table, I want to understand who, who, who are these people. And like, ultimately, this is tied to the economic rights. I know what everyone owns here on a percentage basis, but that doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture. This business sells for 100 million it might not be the preferred ventures gets 12 and a half million. They might be getting more than that because they've got some sort of preferential right attaching to their shares. So I want to know what the economic rights are of, of people on this cap table. There's no provision for future employees or board advices or anything like that. Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? They, they have, uh, in terms of what's needed. Yeah. There's nothing, no provision for future employees. Do like an option pool? Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, there's no option pool on here. Have they set one up? Have they not? Um, if they have, why isn't it included? That should be on here. Um, just some other things which we'll touch upon later. Some other questions which may come up is, why do the founders, founder and founder two, why do they not have the same level of equity? We'll come on to that later as to why that raises questions to investors. Um, why does the COO, who doesn't appear to be a founder, have the same level of equity as a CTO. Are they a founder? Are they not? Again, like people aren't necessarily fully transparent as to what people's role in the business. So it's really important to disclose that to investors. Um, another thing as well is Google Accelerator. It's nice to have a strategic investor on your cap table sometimes. That can be often a good signaling message. But ultimately, an investor might think, well, hang on, this is a major corporation on the cap table here, what sort of rights do they actually have over the business? Do they have a right of first refusal and acquisition? Can they veto certain things? Like, again, some some investors might look at strategic investors as great. Some might think of it as red flags. So it's, again, it's really important to, uh, I think, in that instance, elucidate on what the relationship is with a strategic investor and what, what value they bring. Cool. Good discussion. Right. Now onto the meat, cap table red flags. Um, so we discussed this earlier, which was uh, founder incentives. I'd say this is like the most crucial one. Ultimately, some of the reasons why businesses don't get funded uh, is because, uh, you know, aside from obviously like not having a compelling business and all that kind of stuff, is that effectively the founders are not incentivized. In this in this world, particularly the early stage, the focus is all on you and you know whether you can drive this business all the way ultimately they want to know you know are you going to be incentivized for the long term 
Now, there's no hard and fast rule for this that you must have this at this stage, you must have this at, at Y stage. You can see here we've got um, we've got data here from um, our, our platform. This is from over 1,300 rounds, which kind of show like the median sort of equity being given away um, at each round. The general rule of thumb we say is that if you've given more than 20 to 25% of your business by it before your seed stage, things could become quite difficult at a later stage in terms of raising investment because you're going to take on, you know, when you get to series A, you know, you generally hear investors saying they like the founding team to have over 50% of the business. Sometimes it can be a bit below that, that's fine. But if you're kind of significantly diluted already, investors are thinking you're going to need more money. You're going to need to be, you're going to get further diluted. And ultimately there's going to become a point where really, are you that incentivized working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, but ultimately not as much financial reward as you probably should have? Um, so this is a this is a real key thing of like, and we see we have, I was speaking about this earlier today, we have instance, instances like this in the UK, particularly with universities, where universities take far too much equity from spin outs. There are other countries where in their cultures, you see people giving away equity far too early and that's where the key mantra is like your cap table is your absolute treasure chest. You should protect it. Sorry, we've got a question. There is sign. Does invest do investors share have anti dilution rights? Do investors shares have anti dilution rights? Not the question. Yes. Um. It re well, they they can do. It really depends on what they negotiate. Anti dilution. You don't really tend. To, you don't really tend to see anti dilution rights until you raise from institutional investors like a venture like a venture capital firm. I would consider it very rare for like an angel investor or someone like that. Um, to impose something like that. So I'll answer the question, I hope. If you've got any questions to say, just drop me a message afterwards. Um, so yeah, as I said, what you own in the business and your economic incentive is incredibly important. And again, going back to examples we had earlier, it's not just about your percentage on the table. People want to know, like again, what economic terms sit above you? Are there investors who have really, really onerous liquidation preferences, which means ultimately in a big exit, you wouldn't actually get that much. Um, that again, so not only don't give too much equity away, but I say don't necessarily concede to potentially onerous terms because I say they're not good for you long term. And Well, in the eventual outcome of liquidity, but also if you want to go raise further money from investors. You do see some investors obviously having preferential rights and that's fine, but nothing too horrendous that such that it you know disincentivizes you yeah and that and that covers founder incentives basically yep um well you i i would certainly not not that you put necessarily debt in the cap table but i would certainly disclose any debt yes that there is in your business because uh debt uh convertible debt yes not uh not um like standard term debts like most of the companies we deal with the high growth tech companies who don't really take on traditional debt companies. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah absolutely i mean obviously look you know there there are pros and cons to venture capital like in the ideal world you don't need to raise money but obviously there are instances where either angel investment or venture capital it does make sense but yeah obviously if you can yeah if you the, the best source of revenue is sorry best source of uh, funding is customers um so yeah You wouldn't include debt on a cap table, but you would certainly. Uh, if I if I was sort of raising for investors, I would certainly be disclosing it absolutely. But there are some forms of debt which you can raise, which you would basically put on the cap table and convert it. Everything. Yeah, warrants, convertible debts. Um, well, royalties again. Not that I'm an expert in this, but royalties is more like kind of a contractual thing. No, that that's that doesn't eat at your cap table. That eats at like your profit and loss. No, true, but it's but it's just not related. It's just not related to capital. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's oh, well, absolutely relevant. Just, but I say not in the context of what we're talking about here. I'd say, um, cool. So on to the next one on the subject of founder incentives. You know, chances are if you you know entrepreneur, you have you have a co-founder. Understanding uh, how that equity equity is distributed amongst the founding team is also really important um 
And so what can be a red flag to investors is if you've got co-founders in the business, but there's a significant equity imbalance in between. Now, there's no like prescribed rule that says, you know, founder one and founder two and founder three must have this. Um, but I will say it's the approach we took here, at least at CapDesk before we got acquired by Carter, was that basically equity was split 50-50 from day one. And that was actually the approach that Y Combinator in the US, just like the leading, uh, you know, the, the world's leading incubator, that's also what they recommend from day one. Um, but I think the reason for that, founders like to do that is because they just feel they're all equally aligned. Even if you're not the one who came up, even if you're the one who came up with the idea, the way our founder uh, in Carter Europe said it, he says, I don't want to go to sleep at night thinking that my founders, my co-founders aren't working as hard as me because they own less equity in the business. Which I thought was a quite nice way of presenting it. But look, I've got data here on the left-hand side from over 7,000 companies from our, from our Carter database. And you can see that what I'm saying doesn't necessarily translate in reality. And that's fine. There can be many reasons why there isn't a 50-50 split. So, you know, and typical reasons for that might be, for example, maybe one founder joined the business. He's like, look, I, you know, I want to join, but I can't take this lower salary at this point. I need more salary. So the conversation is there. Okay, fine, we'll give you more salary, but you take less equity. Sometimes you get founders, and founder is a bit of a grey term, you can see, I think, in this world, is sometimes you get founders who join the company later. So maybe your, you know, maybe your CTO joined six months or one year after the product was made. They've joined a bit a little bit later. It's a bit, you know, the, the company's a bit uh, de-risked. So ultimately, that person should have maybe a little, a little bit less equity than the, the, the preceding founder. Um, sometimes doesn't happen all the time, but you might see sometimes if you're raising from investors, they actually think, okay, from the founding team, it's great that you're founders and you should all have equity, but this person here is a real key person and they should have a little bit more equity. And sometimes investors might specify like an equity reallocation. So what I'm saying is, is that look, the common approach is 50-50, but uh, it's, it's fine if it's not, just have kind of a good explanation for why that is. Uh, I think what is more of a red flag is if if you have if there's a significant equity imbalance. So if you've got founder one with 70, 75% and then founder two uh, with something significantly less, uh, you just got to be prepared, prepared to answer those questions. Um, in terms of solutions, if there is an equity imbalance, um, what you can do is rather than issue equities, you can give options to an under allocated founder to say, give them more incentive to stay in the business. Um, we do also have this thing called growth shares in the UK, um, it's, which is a more flexible way of giving out shares, but it's more complex and expensive and probably not really relevant for first time founders. That's comes. Uh, it is like option, I must admit, this is this is where you're stretching the limit of my uh, legal knowledge here. <laughs> but gro 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 growth shares, growth shares effectively Grow shares effectively have like a hurdle price. So you issue you issue them here, and it's it, it, basically they only get them if it's if, if they you know help the business meet certain commercial conditions effectively. That's the main difference. But I say, uh, you, what? Well, sorry, that could be uh, yeah that 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 could be an example. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, I think uh, Facebook had somewhere near five founders. They had, yeah. I mean, I, I I have no idea what the equity allocation was amongst Facebook. I don't know if Facebook did have five founders, probably. It had at least three, I'm pretty certain. But it might it might have been actually four or five. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's a. Fair point. It's a fair point. I mean, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I suppose it. Um, I suppose it could be. I suppose it really depends on the demarcation of people's uh, responsibilities and roles in that business. Um, no, that's a good question. We haven't. We we haven't. Uh, I don't think. Well, we we may have that data. I don't think we've certainly presented on it. Um, I think what we've proven recently is that you don't necessarily need a co-founder. Um, we've, we've, I mean, there's often this mantra that co-founders make the most successful businesses, but uh, on Carter, yeah, we do have a lot of successful businesses that have proven that with co-founders, but they're also single founders that have equally gone on to 
be very successful. Cool. Going to the next one. Uh, this is a really, really common red flag is dead equity. Um, anyone know here? Oh, yeah, questions? Um, I had a question regarding the three founders. Uh, one of the guys on the chat is saying, how come it's not adding up? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Right, the, for the three founders, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I I'm gonna I'm gonna plead the fifth here and say I didn't make this graph. Uh, <laughs> it, it it may have been because yeah, that obviously that doesn't add up to that doesn't get us hundred percent. But it might have been that the equity was so randomly distributed um, amongst others. Uh, yeah, well, actually, no, I think this, no, actually, sorry, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to counter here because I think this does make sense because sometimes this this is showing what they own of the business, not not the equity allocation just amongst the founders. So in this case, if you've got a two-founder business, we look at all the two-founder businesses on our platform, fine, they've raised a bit of capital and maybe given away 10%. Thank you. Okay, there we go. I've managed to... I'm glad I managed to answer that one on the spot. Um, cool, dead equity. So this is a real big one. Anyone here know what I mean by dead equity? No? Dead equity is basically equity that is held by stakeholders who are no longer involved in the company. Now, dead equity is natural. That's fine. Like, you know, when you give, when you raise, say, for an angel for the first time, they might be heavily involved. They own a few percent or whatever. And then eventually, yeah, their interest is going to wane because you've gone off, you've hired loads of people, you don't you don't need their involvement anymore. That's fine. Uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know the dynamic there, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but so I say dead equity to some extent is natural. But obviously what is really bad is if because you've been, say, too generous in your equity allocation, or even, you haven't structured the incentivization right. Where you land up in a position where there are stakeholders in your company who hold a lot of equity in your business, but effectively are doing nothing for the company. Well, yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll get on to that in a second about how the protections. So, yeah, a classic example, like when I showed that uh, cap table example earlier, is if you've been really, really generous in perhaps giving shares to an employee and then they go away after a year. That's equity that you could have preserved for. At, you know, attracting top talent through options, or you know, maybe that's the difference between you raising with investors or not. Um, a probably the most common example is exited founders. So if you had a team of three, you all had a third of the equity. Then one goes, no, do you know what? This isn't for me. I'm leaving. Oh, and by the way, there's nothing you can do because I have 33 percent of the shares. That's a real problem because, uh, as I mentioned, it all ties again to. Your incentives as a founder, it compromises your, you know, your your ability to drive the business forward and raise funding, and also having room to uh, attract top talent. So, uh, a founding partner on the board would he, he or she, technically still possibly own um, debit? If it's a little, and so the silent part of the board and they hold equity, yeah, Would yeah. That, I mean, that yeah. I mean, I suppose. I mean, technically. Well, actually, no. If they're, if they're in the board, you could say the silent partner. If they, it all depends how much, how actively, no, no, no. how yeah, how silently. Exactly, good question. I mean, as I said, like dead equity to some extent is natural. Obviously, there are going to be people who were with you for the early journey, then went. But it, the, the real problem is, is when you've given away significant, significant amounts to people, uh, because ultimately, particularly at the early stage, it's just going to compromise your ability to raise future financing. Early advice is a key one too, like early employees where you give way too much at the beginning. So in terms of how you manage the risk of this, um, basically, again, when you're going out to fundraise, just to kind of, you know, quell any questions of debt equity, just say, you know, again, who these people are, what they're involved in the businesses, all that kind of stuff. It just helps, you know, um, allay any concerns. Um, another risk of managing debt equity, particularly with exited founders, is with all your founders, you should have what's called like a... a a founder service agreement, and that effectively outlines if you leave the business within X amount of time, then effectively you get to keep you know Y amount of your shares. Ultimately, that protects the company because it means not so much equity is lost, and you can preserve that to raise money from future investors and obviously issue more equity to employees eventually. Um, the other thing as well is what you can also, the, the other problem with debt equity is not just so much about economics, but it also goes to the control. 
if you're giving away a lot of equity to people who are no longer interested in the business, that can sometimes affect the actual governance of your company. So for certain decisions, maybe you need 75% approval. But there's loads of people who are in the Bahamas or Philippines and they don't have email and you just can't contact them. So a way you kind of minimize that disruption to your business is basically you can insert rights that effectively limit their, their, their rights of governance of the business. And this is very common for people who are minority shareholders to ensure kind of swift corporate governance. Um, and yeah, the way we do, well, the way it's kind of commonly done is for those who hold less than 5%. Um, in the more draconian example, where it's like, right, okay, we need to do something about this, you can buy the person out and redistribute appropriately. But obviously that is very costly. Um, cool. So now, so we talked a lot about economics um, and a bit of control. I'm going to di deep dive a bit more on control here. And I've got a kind of a, a bit of a, you know, uh, rapid fire here. We've got like three examples are, are on this slide. So investor control is a big one. Um, what we see with a lot of companies, particularly early stages, is sometimes they've given a disproportionate amount of control to an investor. And not so much in terms of the economics, but I say like what, you know, what sort of decisions can they approve? Do you need their consent on, et cetera? Um, that's a, that could be a red flag to investors. Very simple solution, renegotiate. I suppose easier said than done, maybe sometimes, hopefully not. Um, and if you're kind of wondering like what's a disproportionate amount of control or not, really good advice is just to simply um, check the BBCA, which is the British Venture Capital Association, on their website, they have model shareholder agreements, which basically kind of document what's kind of fair and market standard uh, for it, for investor rights in these sorts of instances. Uh, another problem you'll see is investors holding too much. And by that, I don't mean it's in just one investor holding 30% of equity. Rather, I mean you've got a significant percent of equity held by a very, very distributed group of investors. So again, it kind of goes to that point I was saying earlier, if you've got loads and loads of people who collectively hold a lot, but they're not necessarily that actively involved, as I say, they're in the Bahamas, Philippines, whatever, you can't reach them by email, you can't get anything signed off. That can, you know, although that sounds like a pain, that can hold off some of the major life-changing events of your business. You know, for example, like holding up for a funding round and just the general, holding up the general speed of execution in terms of administration. Solutions. On a you know, qualitative level, tie up your investor communications, try and keep your investors engaged. What you can do is if you've got a lot of investors like this, uh, an easy way is to wrap them up um, into what we call a special purpose vehicle. That's just basically taking, let's say, if all of us here in this room, all investors, we all just get wrapped up into one corporate entity. So we sit as one line item on the cap table rather than eight of us. Uh, another way of also kind of minimizing that disruption is just to amend your company articles. Again, just limiting the rights of what your shareholders uh, can and can't approve. Uh, finally, in terms of control, this is rare, but you know we have seen it and obviously just don't ever, ever do this. I think it's the TLDR, it's non-dilutive shares. And that is, you know, and I wanna spell, dispel the difference here between anti-dilutive and non-dilutive. Anti-dilutive shares, you know, that is, that is a common term particularly when you raise from venture capital. Anti-dilutive shares basically protect um, uh, protect an investor's uh, dilution potential to a certain extent. So if, it gets, you, if you go into what's called a down round, i.e. you raise at a lower valuation than your last. Non-dilutive shares are effectively means that you they can never be diluted, which is absolutely awful. Uh, but you know, we have seen founders who have either naively given that away or they've kind of had some rather nefarious investors who've, you know, thought, thought that seems right. Um, this is rare that it happens, but from, we, we work with a lot of law firms here at Carter and they, they again re reiterate that although we don't necessarily non dilute shares, what you what is more common is vague and or poorly drafted wording, which could lead to effectively it being interpreted that you've got non dilutive shares and you really don't want to be getting into those battles with your investors. So really ensure that all that kind of stuff is crystal clear. And if it you are in the situation, unfortunately, where you have done that, it's, you know, the solution is renegotiated terms with your investor. And hopefully that is relatively smooth. Um, we finally, um, pool problems, by pool problems, uh, the option pool. Um, we were talking earlier about obviously setting up an option pool, um, 
this is obviously very, very common practice uh, amongst venture startups because you can't, you don't have the money to give, uh, you know, market competing salaries, but equity is the teaser to incentivize people for the long term and give them this big kind of, you know, monetary carrot when, when that big event comes along. But there are several problems you can face when it comes to actually creating your option pool. Um, problem one is, well, first of all, no option pool has been created, say, post your pre-seed or seed round. If you do get to that instance, you know, option pools are something you should be thinking about very early on. And if you haven't created one, investors might be thinking, why haven't you done this? Ultimately, they might be thinking, have you just been spending too much on salaries, which obviously is not necessarily a good sign at your stage. Um, you know, are options being used to attract, bait, motivate, and retain talent? You know, that's that's a question the you know VCs and any sort of angel investor will not be asking. If you do have an option pool, another problem might be you have one, but it's too small. So what we tend to see the standard is it's ten percent uh, of your fully diluted share capital at seed. If it's under that, again, it might raise questions from investors because they're thinking, you know, you know have you just been not very generous with equity? If you're not being very generous, are you really getting the best talent out there in the market? Um, and then on the flip side of that is what we call the exhausted equity pool. So you have an option pool, but you've given out practically all your options straight away. Uh, that's a problem because it means that, well, you have got, you've now got no options you can give out to future employees and get the big talent. And the only way of solving that is you need to basically make your option pool larger, which means everyone, including investors, gets diluted, and that doesn't make them very happy. So getting it kind of set up correctly from day one is really important. Uh, we say to founders, particularly early stage, your option pool is one of the most important, most early, and most irreversible decisions you can make. So really you know getting it set up right from day one is important and you can see here on the chart we've got on the left this shows like how the option pools evolve again there's no kind of hard and fast rule as to you know it should be this it should be this um but you know 10 percent anywhere between 10 to 15 percent is what you see particularly when you get like a, a first institutional investor coming on board um and you can see here we've got some benchmarks from carter as to what it looks like with time and naturally you are going to expect to see it increase because you're taking more staff on and also you're getting more senior people who you need to give bigger equity packages to. My final one, I promise. <laughs> so the final uh, big red flag is, uh, is spreadsheet based cap tables. And that might seem like an opportune plug, uh, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you actually why this is really important. So I'm going to, take this away from cap tables for a second and i'm gonna say to everyone imagine we're gonna manage your money this way i'm gonna give you a piece of paper and you're gonna write me the starting balance and basically uh every time you make a transaction you're gonna take this piece of paper you're gonna give it to someone they're gonna write they're gonna write down a number give you a, you make might you might make like five 20 transactions a day i don't know about you but i personally wouldn't take that as a very trustworthy source of uh of, of what my balance is and this is the reality of like how cap tables work it's not just you who will be involved in it uh there'll be lawyers there'll be accountants there are multiple parties involved and ultimately there's just that exponentially increases the risk of human error and fine errors happen if you get them in spreadsheets get them in word docs whatever the problem with cap table errors is that number one they're very very easy to miss and unfortunately, as we speak, when we speak to CFOs, I think one of the best things I heard from one of our customers is that cap table errors are discovered at the worst possible time. So i.e. a funding round, an exit, whatever. Um, so say moving away from spreadsheets, which has obviously great things in that it's very flexible, but that's also the weakness of Excel. Having kind of like a rigid ledger, which acts as one source of truth, that gives an investor a lot more confidence that what they're investing in is effectively a ward type business. And it's a good reflection of yourselves that you're kind of exercising this properly with due diligence and care. So I've got a lot of, um, you know, I've got a lot of wording here, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to read out loud. Um, but ultimately, yeah, let's say it's, it, it, I, I think of cap tables almost kind of like an insurance policy. It's a relatively small amount of cost protecting you from what can be a very, very, 
uh, costly, costly error in the future. And when I speak to VCs, they say that whenever it comes to exit, there's always, if they haven't used cap table software, there's always some sort of error. And it costs thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands to repair. Cool. Um, and this is an example of like how, how you can manage it. Carter is an example. Uh, obviously, if you want to learn more about what we can do, come speak to me, come speak to Michael. Um, and yeah, just as a recap today, so I think the key things I want people to learn is that ultimately we talk a lot about cap tables. Just take two words from this, economics control. That's the ultimate thing you should be thinking about when you're issuing options to employees, setting up an option scheme, raising money, raising debt, whatever. Um, it's important, as I mentioned earlier, not just what's on the cap table, but what's off the cap table. That is important to understand the full picture for yourselves and for your investors. Know your cap table red flags. I hope these have been useful today. So at least you think, I didn't know about that, but now I know I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole should it ever present. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned at the end, spreadsheet-based cap tables won't provide you with a single source of truth. It, it's a, it really, really significantly opens up the risk for errors which can affect you at the worst possible time. And thus having a scalable cap table solution uh, will definitely make your life easier. Uh, particularly, I think, in, not that I've been a founder, uh, but I have built products for startups that have um, been successful and also failed. Um, you have to wear many hats. And if you can just have somebody think, no, that's safe. I don't have to worry anymore. That's one less headache in the life of a founder. Um, yeah, and that's it. I just wanted to say as well, oh, well before we go into q and I just want to make aware that uh, say so we have a partnership with Entrepreneurs Collective. So uh, anyone who's a member of this, you can basically sign up to Carter. You get 20% off your first year. Um, you can scan that Q QR code if you like, if you want to learn more, or just simply contact Michael. Um, but yeah, sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. Were there any questions from what I... Anything else? Do we what, sorry? Michael, do you want to answer that? Yes, please. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, we don't record any form of token on the platform. You can still raise using tokens. Uh, you just have to manage that whole process off the platform. So we would just be managing everything related to equity on the platform. So um, securities, um, stock options, uh, everything related to shares and employee equity, anything related to tokens. It, it's not like we're telling companies not to do it. You still can do it. It's just that the recording of that would have to happen outside of the platform. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's on the roadmap. And not, not a lot of companies are are raising using tokens, so uh, it's just not uh, enough of a priority for us. Uh, a significant proportion of like our roadmap in the next quarter is going to be based on um, like how we can support early stage founders with fundraising. Uh, so specifically uh, with uh, like EIS, SEIS support, and then uh, uh, more specifically like generating certain templates, which will hopefully help companies save like time doing it with like a, it, 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 it's, it's easier said than done. I can give you a ballpark figure because like it, it's dependent on a number of uh, different things. Uh, it, it could be anywhere between 1,200 to 4,000 pounds per annum, just dependent on the size of the company, um, you know, the complexity of the cap table. If you're issuing employee equity, do you need a, a an employee equity valuation? Like these are all factors. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> here we... Oh, should we talk about the sales pitch outside the presentation? Just figure out if that does sort of the Just for anything be specific to like cap table. Um, Questions from what we've discussed today. I've got some questions from online. Yeah, um, so Blaga Davidova is asking if we hire early employees, what is considered usual amount of equity to give them as a reward for joining early in the company? And as a follow up, um, 
would their equity be diluted after the next round of funding? Uh, I can answer on a baseline of what I typically see on the market. This is, again, by no means like advice. Uh, for early stage companies, the biggest mistake we see is giving employees uh, shares. Uh, it's, as Nick already touched on in a large section of the uh, presentation, giving employees shares is one of the biggest ways to get to that point of dead equity because what an employee will do is they'll receive shares and they'll leave straight away. The differences with options is um, uh, you, you essentially are tied to an agreement over a certain period of time. Most companies use time-based vesting, which is usually one year cliff and three year um, uh, intervals thereafter. Uh, some use performance-based metrics uh, in order for them to convert those options to shares at a later date. Uh, typically, I think Nick touched on it, uh, the option pool would be between 10 and 15% uh, for a company of like pre-seed to uh, Series A uh, stage. Uh, in terms of the amount of equity, uh, we have some data on that, but yeah. I don't know if you... I can answer that, yeah. Um, one thing I want to touch upon, which, again, you see a lot of literature on this, which we firmly disagree with. Um, you'll see a lot of startup literature say, oh, in the early days, everything's a bit scrappy and you just you just need some people to join. And obviously you, at that point, your cash is probably its lowest. So you want to be like as generous as you can with the equity. Fine, understand that. Um, but one of the real uh, sort of shortcuts we see, which we really disagree with, is giving people equity by a percentage. I.e., I take you as an employee and I say, great, join us as an employee. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to give you 2% of the equity. 2% um, of the equity, you think, oh, sounds relatively small but hey i own a piece I, I i own percent that's very very easy to understand and to convey as a powerful uh, recruitment metric um but that is really not a good idea <laughs> because I mean, for a few for a, for a few reasons is that it's just going to ca cause disharmony further down the line because you know you you'll have other employees join who will probably no way get that 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 sort of treatment um as say there's as michael said there's risk of dead equity um that, and that's the key thing is actually keep them incentivized. So the way we think is the best way is to ascribe options by value, not by a percentage. So let's say you employ someone and you are 30 grand a year below what they could get on the market in terms of salary. So position it this way. Think, okay, fine. We're paying you 30 grand less than what you could earn a year. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you some options. We'll give you £90,000 worth of options that vest over three years. So in three years' time, provided we meet this valuation, you'll have like £90,000 worth. Yes, it is paper value. That's fine. But it's a far more sensible way of doing things. And also, bear in mind, 90000 is the base because you've given them 90000 assuming you get to a certain valuation. But it's very early. That valuation could go up and up and up. So that... You know, obviously, if you give them ninety thousand pounds, it's not saying you will have ninety thousand pounds because it all depends if the startup gets liquidity and hey, if the startup even survives. Um, but at least there's that carrot saying no, this could go up in the future and be significantly worth more. So ascribe your options by in terms of the monetary value you're thinking of, rather than just giving people um, a percent. When you get to later stages, there's all sorts of like multipliers you could use, which we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, the, the, the value is one. And again, if anyone has any further questions on that, we can talk about it in further detail after this. Okay. Um, Andrew Smith asks, what is the solution to the problem equity allocation, i.e. of giving out enough equity to ensure motivation and not too much to lose control? And also, uh, can AI solve this? I think I got the, what was the second question, sorry? Can AI solve uh, solve this? Okay, uh, not a deep AI, AI expert, so <laughs> don't think I can get to that to, to that part. Um, in terms of in terms of equity allocation, I mean, and I it, I suppose it's hard to interact via Zoom, so I don't know whether they're talking about like um, uh, what's it like with investors versus employees. Uh, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> when it comes to negotiating equity equity allocation from investors, the investor will be very clear like what they want. And it's up to you, obviously, to 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 obviously negotiate that balance of whether that's right for you. I think with 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 uh, issuing equity to employees, um, I we've got a good table which we annoyingly don't have in this presentation. But 
uh, ultimately when you're when you're comping employees, it's the balance between salary and equity. Uh, and with time, obviously, you know, at the beginning, equity is the big weight. That's the big driver. And then obviously, as you get more money, you can pay them more and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, you know, money is also an incentive to stay around uh, in places. But you, want, you know, ideally, when I see kind of, you know, tables, comp, outlining all this, you still want to have that balance of, you know, of, of making it basically, you know, attractive to stay. In the early stages, it's attractive to stay because your equity could grow significantly. In the late stages, it's attractive to stay because, yes, salary is compelling, but there is also the equity component as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's that balance between, yeah, <laughs> keeping keeping people incentivized to stay now and to stay for the future. Hope that didn't get too, like, kind of holistic. But... So Andrew um, added to your question, Think of it like capital allocation to stocks, et cetera, in diversification. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. But if you want, Andrew, say, message me after this and I'll happily discuss further. Perfect. Um, so Finn's details can be found in the chat. I've put them up. So um, you'll be... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Through LinkedIn. I, I put in your LinkedIn. Cool. Link. Fantastic, fantastic. Brilliant. Well, that's any questions. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, well, empl well, employee-owned businesses. I mean, what? Oh, uh, well, yes. I don't know the John Lewis partnership structure. To be honest with you, but obviously John Lewis partnership, not a company, as far as I understand. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, and well, customer-owned businesses. You mean like kind of businesses that are raised by crowdfunding? Yeah. Um. Oh, okay. I mean, interesting. Uh, yeah, interesting dynamic. I must admit, I just don't know enough about those sorts of businesses too. I have well of thirty thousand customers. I obviously, I obviously will not know the answer to that. Um, but no, I mean most most of the companies we deal with are kind of venture backed, high, high high growth businesses. Where obviously, just because of the dynamics, you you need the the key executives of bands of the business to be incentivized with obviously the help of institutional capital, and obviously employees incentivized to stay and drive value for the long term. Uh, so what kind of like private like private equity type businesses? Maybe I wouldn't. I say it's, uh, thirty thousand customers, so I wouldn't necessarily know. Um, cool. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I say if there's any other questions, are if you want to just approach me or Michael separately after this, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, whether it's cap table or Carter. Yeah, I think it'll be shared after this. Shortage High Street. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much. Say, so if you need to approach Michael B for any questions afterwards, happy to field any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.